and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, gang? And a happy Monday to you all. Welcome to a uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk Monday edition. Coming to you live from Music City in Nashville, Tennessee, where the Jets will be taking on the Predators tomorrow night down at Bridgestone Arena or to um, getting down there for the morning skate tomorrow and uh, banging off tomorrow's show from Bridgestone for the Jets and Preds drop the puck. Nice win for the Jets to officially sweep the wild for the season series 4-0. Send them packing to the golf course while the Jets get ready to uh, play the call. Well, potentially the Colorado Avalanche of a compete Stanley Cup playoffs. 100 points on the season. What a year it's been and uh, has uh, get to a little bit. Jets kind of moving past that ugly six game losing streak, winning three in a row right now and uh, getting ready, continue to build the degree of difficulty through this uh, road trip, starting with the wild who are not a playoff team. And now with three playoff teams tomorrow in Nashville, Thursday in Dallas and Saturday against the Colorado avalanche. Uh, Going to be a fun show today. We'll kind of get back to Saturday here from Rick Bonus and uh, a few of the stars of the game, including his dominant performance by the Winnipeg Jets fourth line. Um, and then Connor Rabchak was down in practice today. We'll get a bit of a practice re- report from Connor before the team leaves this afternoon to join us here in Music City. Jeff Hamilton from the Winnipeg Free Press is going to jump on the program. And at 2.30, really looking forward to this, Bob Herrig. Uh, has a new book coming out on Tiger Woods. Of course, he had the incredible book, uh, Tiger and Phil. He had him on at that point, and um, there is so much going on in the world of golf. Uh, shout out to my guy, Akshay Badia, who uh, came through us with a one winner lock shot, making a great week last week, even better. And now, of course, uh, the top stars from Live join the top stars in the PGA Tour eat for a green jacket we'll have lots of masters um coverage this week feinberg's going to join us tomorrow make some picks and whatnot and uh, definitely check out the lock shop this week. uh we've hot and no better time to be hot than masters um but focus in on the jets right now right off the bat we'll get remus in here in a minute welcome to everybody listening on podcast thanks for making us a part of your routine and your day shout out to the gang and chat I don't have the chat open because I don't have multiple screens like I normally do. But I have already heard that there are eclipse emojis in the chat. And uh, it is a wet Winnipeg eclipse talk amongst people there. By the way, speaking of that, so I'm in Nashville right now. I believe we're getting like a 95% eclipse. Now, it's sort of cloudy right now. Probably not the best, but uh, I think Hammer will be on at that point. I'll try and stick my head out and if we see any at that point. Um, just before we bring in Michael Remus, though, got to thank the sponsor to make this show happen each and every day. The wonderful people of Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, the Winnipeg Jets, Little Brown Jug, Boston Pizza and Royal Sports, Consolidated Supply, Canadian Club, Modern Man Barbershop, Manitoba Battery, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, F Apparel, Wallace and Wallace, Breezy Bend Country Club. Golf season is just about here. You know what that means when the Masters is. And, of course, Sport Manitoba, supported by Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. Michael Remus, get in here. Have you calmed down from our uh, our testing session earlier this morning? Oh, no. Uh, thankfully, we didn't stream that live. You know, technology <laughs> is funny. Sometimes things work as they should, and sometimes they don't, and you don't know why. And 
Uh, we've done our fair share of troubleshooting, but you were there in Nashville at the hotel, uh, looking good, sounding good. Um, so I'm excited that, yeah, that we're able to do this. This is great, but a little stressful before, uh, but it works. So that's what matters. Listen, just before we get into uh, all of the Jets talk, um, did you see WrestleMania last night? I did. I made sure. I wanted to see uh, Cody Rhodes finish the story. This has been building <laughs> for so long. And I don't even watch it. Like, I don't watch it <laughs> weekly, but I've seen, you know, two of the big events. And I've seen enough of Roman Reigns, like, win the belt by interference. So I was curious as how they were going to do it last night in Philadelphia. It's, you know, 73,000 at uh, Eagles Stadium. And, you know, they always bring out, like, Snoop Dogg. Being there is cool, and you know the rocks involved this year. So I was, my interest was definitely up there uh, heading into the weekend. Well, I mean, it had a little bit of everything. Saturday, Jason Kelsey uh, and Lane Johnson of the Eagles were ringside wearing wrestling masks, came in and interfered in a match and helped Rey Mysterio get a win. But last night was all about the main event. It was bloodline rules, so everyone expected a whole bunch of interference. Uh, but who could have imagined? Uh, the Usos being out there, well, most people. Seth Rollins and his old Shield stuff, that was neat. John Cena coming in and doing the AA on <laughs> Roman Reigns and on uh, and on Solo Sokoa. But then The Rock came out, as we all expected. But honestly, when the lights went dark and the gong happened, that might have been the biggest pop, one of the biggest pops in wrestling history for The Undertaker in five of the most chaotic but greatest moments in WrestleMania, wrestling history, and then Cody Rhodes did do it. It, it. it dominated social media for most of the evening until, and I will quickly tell this story, uh, I went down, Kenny Weeb came and joined me for uh, the second half in the main event with my pal Mookie, so we're watching it downtown at a great sports bar. We moved around afterwards, and my pal Book's a big, big country music guy. And he's telling me Eric Church, I believe that's who it is. Eric Church has this new place called Chiefs. I guess that's his nickname. Six-story bar, different band on every floor like you have all around downtown Nashville. And uh, apparently, Morgan Wallen, I'm not sure whether he was just so excited about Cody Rhodes' win in WrestleMania or um, as uh, one of his songs says, he was letting the liquor talk. But Morgan Wallen tossed a chair off the rooftop bar of the sixth floor of this chief's place, narrowly missing two Nashville police officers and somebody else. And it ended up, he's got three felony counts of reckless endangerment and some others. Um, so complete moron move by Morgan Wallen, who this is not his first run in with the law. Um, but just sort of bizarre that that was about 100 meters or so from where I was at the time. At the, I went down and checked out the Barstool Sports Bar. Um, but uh, quite a night down here in Nashville, Remus, uh, coming off of a WrestleMania that everyone will remember. You can always get up to a lot of fun there in Nashville. We had a great time at the draft. I know you've been there before, but I don't know if I've ever been to a Jets game there. I hear I posted on, uh, well, where's the pictures being at WrestleMania? Here's you and Ken Weeb yesterday meeting up at the bar for wrestlemania and i posted on instagram and i I, we had some comments that were saying a lot of winnipeg uh, jets fans heading down nashville great cities you mentioned a lot of those multi-story bars where there's a different band on on every floor very popular there and you know the weather is kind of warming up so but here you guys are last night taking in wrestlemania so yeah ken will join you tomorrow but, yeah, uh, we'll get Ken. We'll get Ken live. Uh, we'll get Max Hers on tomorrow. Feinberg's gonna jump. Tomorrow's gonna be a super fun show, and it should be great. And yeah, you mentioned Jets fans. Um, we took the flight from Fargo early on Sunday morning, and there was at least a dozen people, probably more, on the flight, um, rocking Jet stuff. So um, kind of a neat time. You grab a cheap flight, head down for a few days in Nashville, and get a chance to see your team on the road. Uh, before things get going for uh, for the Stanley Cup playoffs, so I'm looking forward to it. But you know, let's let's quickly before we sort of look ahead. Um, 
you know, often a game will happen on Saturday and you kind of talk about it quickly and move on. But the wild game significant for a number of reasons. Um, from a fan perspective, for their biggest rivals, a team that many Jet fans feel has taken cheap shots and liberties with this team, um, to sweep them in the fashion that they did warmed everybody's hearts. Um, but when you talk about a team getting ready for the playoffs, to see the Jets' fourth line play the way they did with all three members of the line scoring, um, that is exactly what you want to have as you get ready. And we talked about this as sort of a dress rehearsal for everything that's going to be going down um, come game 83 and beyond. And uh, led by Morgan Barron, who had a monster game, Vlad right in there, Alex Iafalo with the deflection off Brendan Dillon's shot. Um, the story in a lot of ways, we've spent so much time talking about the first and the second line. Sometimes you forget about the bottom six. Uh, that was impossible on Saturday. You know, when the Winnipeg Jets were winning a lot of those games in December, when they were playing so well, it wasn't just, you know, the top line, the top guys getting. They were getting some big contributions at times from Axel Janssen, Fialbi, Dominic Toninato was a point-per-game player for a bit, and you just hadn't seen that for a while. Um, the offense from I thought the third line's kind of dried up a bit. The fourth line, you hadn't seen it a ton. So, you know, when your top guys aren't scoring and your bottom guys aren't scoring, nobody's scoring. And we saw that during that six-game losing streak. So, uh, look, in the playoffs, you're going to need contribution from everyone. It's a short series, and, uh, you know, in a rivalry game, uh, you know, we didn't talk enough on Friday. I didn't even realize they were going for the sweep against Minnesota, but I'm sure that they oh, knew, and I'm sure they were fired up uh, to be, because we can ask the chat, who's the Jets' biggest rival? I'm going to say uh, Minnesota right now. has, and Maybe Vegas might be the most hated as well by fans. Two playoff losses and just, you know, the expansion team coming in and winning the Stanley Cup. But, uh, yeah, it was, a big, it was a big one. Nemestikov, one goal, two assists. I follow two points. Barron. Getting a goal as well. Big performance. And these are good players. And these are all players us who, except for Baron, but Nemeskov has probably played every, every position on every line. Afalo has been a part of every line on this team. And Baron's been, you know, kind of third or fourth. Maybe the occasional once in a while gets moved up a bit more. But uh, these are really strong players. And you think of uh, the best team, Winnipeg Jets teams uh, ever. This fourth line, I don't know, is it their best fourth line? Is it going to beat the 2018? Fourth line, these guys are all solid. And, and you look at the Jets' depth, how many guys they have over 10 goals? Well, all those guys uh, do have over 10, and they all can contribute. So uh, you're going to need contributions from everywhere. And you saw that certainly on Saturday, sweeping Minnesota, which uh, I had to feel good. Uh, just all the BS that you get from them every game. I'm sure they were fired up. I was, we met up uh, down in Fargo with a couple of, uh, of friends that are from Winnipeg that live down there. And we went to, by the way, Sleeper, I'd never been to this place before. Legends, I believe it's Legends Sports Bar, Legends Bar and Grill. It's in, uh, I think it's technically in Moorhead, Minnesota, like just mm -hmm. over the bridge. Unbelievable. Unbel like just a great, great bar. Uh, their food was ridiculous. They serve a Caesar between 1 and 2, or 11 and 2 which is essentially a lunch special stuck into a Caesar. I mean, there's wings, and um, I can't even remember all the stuff in there, but it was the most bizarre thing I've seen. But they do some promos. So there was a bunch of other Wild fans there. They kind of noticed our presence cheering on the Jets. And not only did the Jets win, complete the sweep, but to add insult to injury, uh, our table won the lucky ticket at the end and won drink, a round of drinks for us. And it was only <laughs> proper, it was only appropriate that, you know, to the winner goes the spoils and the Jet fans were the ones that were happy. But uh, listen, it was a nice win. We'll get to a little bit of the audio coming up. But Reem, let's pull up the standings because, you know, we kind of talked about the Jets had that really ugly run. I mean, it, Pete, all teams are not just cruising right now at, at you know, at, at maximum um, uh, potency. Um, the Avalanche have been losing some games. They got smoked by Edmonton 6-2, uh, and then they lost to Dallas last night. And with the Jets pulling off three wins in a row after losing all those games, home ice in round one is still very much on the line. As you'll see, the Jets are two points back of Colorado, 
with a game in hand and of course play the avalanche in denver on saturday and you know i i was watching some of that edmonton um edmonton colorado game and they showed when mckinnon and um connor mcdavid were on the ice uh, going head to head and the speed of both of those players and how tenacious they both were checking the other guy um I mean, the first thing I thought is just what a handful that's going to be for Mark Shifley. Um, and, you know, Rick Bonus at home will be putting Adam Lowry out against it. But we've already seen Jared Bednar at every opportunity when he has the last change in Colorado stick his big guns up against the Shifley line. Uh, the potential of a seventh game being in Winnipeg with Bones having the last change I think certainly is something to fight for right now. And, um, you know, they can help their chances tomorrow by beating the, uh, by beating the, uh, the Nashville predators. And if they win that game in hand, they actually go into second place because the jets have more regulation wins. They have more regulation and overtime wins. So they would get that tiebreaker, but um, you know, there's pros and cons to playing a team like Colorado green, but Right now, the Avalanche have kind of seen they had that incredible run, but then they lose to Montreal, they lose to Columbus, and now recent wins, albeit to playoff teams at Edmonton and Dallas, has sort of opened the door for Winnipeg after looking like they were likely third place to maybe sneak into uh, into second if they can continue this run that they're on. Yeah, Dallas is looking really strong. Uh, they have three very, very good lines, and you saw that yesterday against Colorado. I know... And we say, oh, Dallas has the Jets number here as, you know, they pasted them uh, earlier, you know, was it last month in, uh, in Dallas. But Dallas is doing that to just about everyone. And the Avalanche, us, as far as a matchup for the Jets, I think there's some questions about their forward depth and questions about goaltending. So uh, for them to have the matchup advantage would be huge in a first round series. And you look at it, yes, they're two points back with one game in hand. And as far as regulation overtime wins, the Jets are up 47 46. Uh, the Jets are up 42 40 in regulation wins. Very, very tight. They do play on Saturday in Denver. So that's going to be a pretty, uh, pretty big game. And oh, yeah. You look at the last 10. Yeah, Colorado 5 4 and 1 in the last 10 on a two game losing streak. The Jets 4 5 and 1 on a three game winning streak now. And as funny as listening to uh, Kenny and Rennie on Saturday, and they're just saying, yeah, does this three-game win streak erase the stench of the six-game losing streak? And I think it kind of does. You're only you're as good as, you know, we're, we're very, like, day-by-day approach. We're only as good yep. as your last game. And the Jets are playing well here. Three-game win streak, a chance to make it four and get a little revenge here on Nashville uh, tomorrow. And the Jets did practice today in Winnipeg, returning to Winnipeg after the game in uh, Minneapolis, uh, you know, the, what is a one and home and not continuing on to Nashville. So uh, we'll hear more about today's practice. But the Jets in a, in a pretty good spot here, I think, in terms of battling for the second spot in the Central. Yeah, I mean, hey, listen, they're right in it. I mean, they'll be playing meaningful games uh, right up until uh, the Canucks on the Thursday. Um, and, you know, is it the end of the world if they don't get it? No. I mean, you pretty much know what this matchup is going to be. Uh, but to start it off on home ice with that that last change and potentially to have that situation in your own barn for Game 7, certainly something I think the Winnipeg Jets would uh, would like to have. Speaking of practice, um, Connor, uh, Connor Rabchak was down there. Uh, we'll check up with him in a few minutes just after we get to a little bit of this audio uh, for what was happening today. Uh, and don't forget, it's Monday, and you know what that means already. Yeah, hopefully you've already checked it out, but in your podcast feed and on YouTube, a much more upbeat edition of Winnipeg Jets this week than Connor <laughs> was able to do the previous couple weeks. And you know, you probably enjoy those ones more than normal. Uh, so check it out. Connor does such a great job on those with the three stars of the week, the hardest working jet and much more. And a lot to talk about coming out of the Minnesota game, as we mentioned with that big, big performance by the Winnipeg Jets fourth line. Um, let's hear a little bit of uh, uh, Rick Bonus, um, and maybe the funniest quote that John Liu tweeted out. Uh, I think the original plan was the Jets were going to be here in Nashville today, um, but after what happened on that Eastern road trip, uh, Bones said very matter-of-factly uh, and offered it out without being asked, uh, 
think we'd we prefer not to have them in Nashville for um, as long as possible. So back in Winnipeg today, this afternoon, heading out here to Nashville and uh, the game um, tomorrow. But uh, here's what Bones had to say. Obviously, the talk of the game was uh, everyone on the fourth line getting on the scoreboard. Here was uh, Rick Bonus on the win over the Wild and the play of his fourth line. That's a good hockey club over there, and we we held them to very few chances against. Um, I know the first period they had a lot of shot attempts, but not a whole lot of... As long as we're limiting yep. those grade-A chances against, we're doing a good job, and I thought we did a good job managing the puck a lot better as the game went on going through the neutral zone. Uh, you saw a couple of shifts where we had them hemmed in their zone pretty good. They had us hemmed in there in one zone as well and one uh, play in the second, but overall it, it was a very good team effort. Stood out to play your fourth line today. Yeah, they did a great job. They, they got, I mean, they got three goals, right? And they, they just know how to play the game the right way. Vladdy was outstanding. Uh, Morgan at the front of the net, you know, got a tip, but he's he's responsible for Dilly's goal because he's right in front of the goalie. Alex, you know what you're going to get from him every shift. He just goes out there and he works. So uh, that line, that line was a big difference maker tonight. All right, um, Bones had a little bit more now. Uh, the power play in the game uh, was 0 for 2. Um, so two chances, nothing to show for it. Three for four on the PK. Uh, power play remains a work in progress. Here's Bones on what he saw from the power play and uh, then also gets into their defensive performance. It can be better. Anything so the entry seemed to be an issue? Issue, time. yeah. The whole thing, yeah. Just not cohesive? Wasn't in sync, no. Okay, uh, what about the defense? What do you think of the defense score as a whole? Oh, really good. You know, again, again, we held them the few chances as we did. Your defense are doing a good job. Our forwards are doing a good job coming back, making good reads, picking up the right guys. We're, we've been much better the last couple of games on the, uh, against the rush. We were giving up too many chances earlier in the rush, and we've cleaned that up a little bit the last couple of games. But the D need the help from the forwards, so the forwards get a lot of credit backtracking, picking up the right guys, and able to keep their gap up. All right. Uh, Bones also, uh, this is a shorter uh, answer, I believe, but talked a little bit more about the competition on the blue line for spots in the top six once uh, the playoffs begin. Well, not so much a competition. It's so much as just keep them all playing because, again, no one's playing themselves out of the lineup, but we have to keep everybody playing. So, uh, yeah, we'll, when we get to that point, we'll make the right decision. All right, and one more from Bones, and uh, I can tell you, I won't speak for uh, anyone that, you know, is a fan of the Winnipeg Jets, but, man, it was sweet to sweep the Minnesota Wild considering everything that's happened the last couple of years. Here's Bones on completing the season sweep and uh, getting the brooms out at XL Energy Center. Yeah, I mean, that's nice, but, again, I guess we do have the two points. It's nice to get the road wins. Uh, again, we have a lot of respect for that team and that organization. Uh, and Billy and his staff has done a great job here. It's a good team. It's a great organization. Yeah, if we can sweep them, great, but we just, we'll take the two points against anybody. I know the focus is on your group, but now within two points of the avalanche, that sort of kind of up, up the yeah, intensity well, we for that just, battle for second? Or? We're going to get ready for Tuesday in Nashville. <laughs> Bones. Uh, maybe not as effusive as some of the fans were about it, but it would have been great, Reem, if he actually just pulled the curtain back and said, yeah, it was sweet, man. F those guys or something to that extent. <laughs> yes, 100%. I know you want to respect your opponent, but I don't know if Minnesota has shown respect towards the Jets the last couple of years, notably uh, players like Marcus Foligno, who wasn't playing, and Ryan Hartman, uh, who was suspended. You know, I'm thinking next year maybe we can put – I listed a number last week, Huss. Uh, it was the total Ryan Hartman has lost in suspensions. Like, we should just bring a sign that has his face and, like, that number or something. It was, like, ridi like ridiculous numbers. So I would we'll like to, to hear. wait until next year because, as we know, the Wild no mm -hmm. longer relevant this season in the National Hockey League, making tee times while 16 teams yeah. that have an opportunity to play in the Stanley Cup playoffs will be doing so coming up in a couple of weeks. I did enjoy this tweet during the game from Michael Russo. I don't know if you saw this one, us, but uh, like this is what it is between the Jets and the Wild. Uh, Kaprizov cross check to the ice by Morgan Barron for a penalty. The six foot seven Logan Stanley, who injured Kaprizov last season and adversely altered the Wild season. 
comes over for a cheap shot at Kaprizov while he was on the ice. Then he goes after Marco Rossi during skirmish. L-O-L. And I just uh, gave that one a nice retweet and enjoyed a lot of the responses to that. So not only, I mean, the players, um, you know, the players getting into with each other, also the beat writers. It's funny, like, I don't, like, the Wild, like, Russo and a lot of the Wild fans, I feel like see the Jets as this team of goons that go after Minnesota, and they don't, like, we watch this team, they don't get into it with any other team. It's only Minnesota. It's only Ryan Hartman, uh, Marcus Foligno, like, all the guys on that team. So, I, I don't well, know what it. I don't know what it is, Hus, but it seems to be only with Minnesota. I don't think the Jets are are starting up that kind of, kind of BS with anyone else. So no, no, and you know what? Colin Fast made a great point um, after that. Minnesota is like you know like I guess it was some wild fan responding to that saying Winnipeg is so cheap and dirty, uh, and then Colin pointed out Minnesota's the third most penalized team in the league. The Jets are twenty fifth. If anything, we might not be cheap and dirty enough. <laughs> that to everybody else. Um, but but the Russo, and I got to give a shout out to Ali Campbell. She's at Ali Campbell WPG on Twitter. She quote tweeted the Russo tweet and just said, from the well, wild fans response to this, I'm very glad we got out of the game uninjured and Hartman wasn't playing. And I read that. It's almost like her just, casually referring to Russo as one of the wild fans, <laughs> which to me made it that much sweeter. Anyways, uh, nice way to finish it off with the, uh, with the season sweep of the wild. And now the jets move on to the playoff teams in the central division, including, uh, including tomorrow night. Um, just though we're going to talk practice and get the latest from today with Connor in a minute. Um, but listen, Morgan Barron, uh, he was sort of singled out by Bones with a big, big performance. He spoke after the game and that just talked about the game, uh, their performance, and also ramping up for the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of felt like we've been all around it and strung together some good games, but, um, you know, Puck obviously just bounced away a little bit more tonight than maybe it has the last few games. So um, it's always fun when you can kind of do that. And I saw they changed it and uh, Alex got the goal there. So. Um, I feel bad for Dilly, but everyone on our line gets one, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, right on. Uh, is it awesome? Vladdy called it a dress rehearsal. I mean, come playoff time, you want the four lines going. Is that sort of part of the equation here now, too? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a little biased to it, but I'd obviously like all four lines to be going and um, you know, playing well and, and playing often. And you see the the recipe for success that some of those teams have had um, in the past. We've won the cup. You look at Vegas last year, and um, you know, the, the fourth line was. Um, you know, impactful in, in a lot of different ways throughout the whole playoffs. So, um, yeah, dress rehearsal for everyone. I mean, obviously we had that little slump there, but, um, you know, we'd see the end of the runway here before playoffs start. So uh, we're just trying to treat everything like a playoff game right now and really hit our stride at the right time. All right, here's a little bit more from Morgan Barron. I'm uh, talking about being two points back of Colorado um, in striking distance to get home advantage in a potential 2-3 playoff series. And of course, the sweep of arrival in the wild. You know, we have we have a tough schedule, and I, I was actually peeking at their schedule there last night. They're, theirs is equally as tough as ours, and um, you know we have that head-to-head -head matchup coming up here in a few days. So uh, it's exciting. You know, this is where you want to be this time of year. Is um, you know in the hunt, trying to trying to claw claw away some points from uh, the teams above you and, and take their place. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's tough to sweep a series at any time. What's it like to do it against the wild here? We know there's a team mm -hmm. a lot of history with. Uh, what's it like to? to have a clean sheet against them. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, you know, obviously the, the team's changed a lot from the start of the year to now, but, um, you know, to, to do it, and the games have been pretty spread out. I feel like we've done it kind of in every phase of our season as well, so um, not easy to do, like you yeah. said, and obviously it was a little chippy there at times, but um, to see it come out our way is great. Uh, and I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but like a sly smile that was cracked by Morgan Barron while Weaver was asking the question. Uh, great stuff. For the sugar Vladdy, Vlad Demetsnikov, who uh, scored. And he, Vlad spoke briefly after the game as well. Here's what he had to say about the performance of the fourth line and uh, things going their way. Just pucks were doing it, I guess. Um, nothing really changed in our game. Got it deep, cycled, and... Try to get pucks in that, and um, 
they're going in today. So hopefully we can continue. You talked about your depth all year long. What does it mean this time of year to, to have all four lines contributing? Yeah, these are big, uh, big games, big points, much needed. So. Um, yeah, we've been talking about all year. If we want to be successful, we got to have all four lines uh, contribute and, and look the same. And I think tonight we did that. It's become more and more important though with the playoffs just around the corner. Yeah, I, I guess this kind of a rehearsal. You know, we, we've clinched, but we have to continue playing the right way and kind of bringing the momentum into the playoffs. Yeah. All right, there's Vlad. Big performance by the fourth line. We'll talk a little bit more about it with Connor coming up in just a minute. Before we bring Connor in post practice, um, got to shout out our friends at Consolidated Supply who are ready for spring. Um, so many projects that you or your business may have on the go, the folks at Consolidated Supply can help you out. If you need irrigation services or products, they are the irrigation leaders in Manitoba. Of course, they do incredible work with artificial turf as well. And they are the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba for uh, golf carts, both new and used. Uh, they've also got great other options for your property, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchen options. And, of course, they are also the leaders in small engine parts and repair. Check them out at their showroom, open to the public, 1395 Niaqua Road East, or check them out online at cte.ca. Uh, I know Donnie... And the gang at Manitoba Battery are busy right now because the bring, big spring sale is on. For you folks that are farmers or if you're in construction, now's the time to get your equipment ready for the upcoming year. And Manitoba Battery has great deals for people that drive half tons, um, the larger batteries as well. And again, if you've got, if you do need golf carts or you have golf carts and operate them, great deals. $129.99 and six volt golf cart batteries as well. Of course, they've got a second location now open on Dover Court, the original one over on Logan Avenue. Uh, shop local, get the best prices in town, bar none, and get ready for spring with the Manitoba Battery Spring Sale on right now. Check them out online at manitobabattery.com. You'll see I'm not wearing a hat today. Finally got a haircut. It was a great weekend down at Modern Man Barber Shop on uh, Pemina. Uh, celebrating their first anniversary. Uh, shout out to Cordell and the gang down there. Um, I know there was plenty of winners that were spinning the wheel after their haircuts. Uh, what you need to know, folks, if you need a great cut, Modern Man is there for you. Not just haircuts, but uh, beard shaping, shaves, and more. An incredible selection of products. Easiest way to find one of eight Modern Man barbershops near you is go online, make an appointment, and book your look at modernmanbarbershop.com. Uh, and, hey, a big cheers to the Jets' four-game sweep of the Minnesota Wild. And if you're cheersing your friends, you may as well make it the best in Canadian whiskey, Canadian club since 1848. Nothing better than a Canadian club after a big win. or a night day at work, you can get all the Canadian club products all summer long at, at uh, Princess Auto Stadium as the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And next time you're in a Manitoba Liquor Marts, make sure to check out the Canadian Club display for all the latest from Canada's number one Canadian whiskey. All right, let's uh, let's bring in the kid. Connor Rabchek joins us today. He was down at practice today, mixing it up and the uh, as the Jets did on the ice before they head out to join myself and Ken Weeb here in Nashville for the game tomorrow. Connor, what's up? It was great seeing you at the game on Thursday with the WST crew and uh, obviously a nice weekend. How was it for you? On uh, on that night against Calgary, big win for the WST ticket pack. Um, I think that was the talk of amongst the group as they had the to win. As the a, future the, was the, on the line. Yeah, it was a must win and they, they got the win. And then Saturday, yeah, great game uh, for the Jets. And it was, it was a great weekend, great weather here in Winnipeg. So no complaints. Well, and, you know, we I mean, listen, I, justifiably so, everyone was freaking out when the team had some of those ugly games over the course of that six-game road trip. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, they're sort of now exactly what you'd want to see them building. Um, it's certainly not there yet. We talked to Rick Bonus, and we just heard his comments, not too pleased with what's going on with the man advantage right now. And that's something against a team like Colorado you are going to have to have uh, making an impact and obviously improve the PK. Um, but just for what it's worth, 
a sweep of the Minnesota Wild. Um, lots of lots of smiles and a happy Saturday night for Winnipeg Jet fans after they were able to finish the job and send that team to making tea times. Huss, what's better, sweeping the the Wild or if the Bombers won both Labor Day and the Banjo Bowl? <laughs> that's that's, that's like the equivalent question. right um no but a sweep of the wild yeah all the drama between those two teams not only just this season but going back years and years and even the last game of the year last year where Ehlers was out for the playoffs because of that hit um the question was is it going to carry over into next season and then it didn't but there was new stuff that happened and the Ryan Hartman admitting to Cole Perfetti that he intentionally high sticked him and all that and then um, the, the, was it a vicious cross check from Brendan Dillon? There was just so much. And then the, the vicious cheap shot from Logan Stanley, where he basically just poked at Kaprizov skates, um, in this latest game. We'll see if that carries over into next year. Um, but no, Hey, four and zero on the, on the, the win column is all that matters. And, uh, yeah, the jets are, are not a dirty team except for against Minnesota when they're the most vicious, volatile yeah. team in the this NHL good um, squad. Good yeah, squad. yeah, but no, that was a great game Saturday. Fun game to watch for sure. Two teams that were, is there was some intensity there? Well, and of course, you know, moving on into uh, the rest of the gauntlet through the Central Division, uh, kind of you know go, go up a weight class to the Minnesota Wild, and then the top two teams who played last night, and you know Colorado right now, you know after that crazy winning streak that you know the Jets were playing really well and could not get any room on them, then they sort of fell off, fell behind both Dallas and Colorado. Dallas, for the most part, has continued it, although they did somehow lose to Chicago on the weekend. I don't know if anybody yeah. saw that happening. But the Avs, after losing to Montreal and losing to Columbus, um, get worked by the Oilers. And then the Dallas Stars last night, and, you know, it is very much on the table. And while we're talking about good teams that, you know, have had off nights, the Vegas Golden Knights gave up six unanswered to the Coyotes on Friday and blew a 4-1 lead and ended up losing 7-4. So different teams dealing with different things right now. None of it's going to matter if they play well at the beginning of the playoffs. But things have got a little more interesting. I mean, a week ago at this point, after what had happened, even second place seemed a little bit unrealistic. Now, very different story with the Jets having the tiebreaker, being two back with a game in hand. And, of course, a head-to-head matchup coming up on uh, on Saturday. Yeah, and that game Saturday is huge. I think it was after the the Calgary game before the Jets had headed on the road trip. There were players even in the, the post game scrum after that talking about the Colorado game coming up because they, they haven't been able to beat Dallas this year. And obviously that's a huge game on the Thursday night as well to avoid getting swept. Um, but it looks like Dallas is going to be the central division title unless they lose out and the abs went out or the Jets went out. That's really the only possible way, um, especially last night with Dallas beating Colorado in regulation. That's all but a lock. But that game on Saturday against Colorado, the Jets have a game in hand right now. They have the tiebreaker. They have more regulation wins. If you can go into Colorado and win um, in regulation or in overtime, just gain any points on the abs in that sense, that they could be in the driver's seat uh, for the second seed. And you guys talked about it off the top, the importance of that two seed and the matchups, having Adam Lowry, out there every single time Nathan McKinnon steps on the ice is going to be huge, whether it's game one or game seven. um, Having that shutdown line out there against Colorado's top line, because we know how lethal that line can be. McKinnon is in the heart race for a reason. Um, So it's definitely important. You'll hear players say like, eh, it's whatever. Or you'll hear Rick Bonus say that uh, it's more important how we're playing, which is true. It is more important how the Jets are playing. But at the same time, having the matchups, having last change, Having the Winnipeg whiteout around you, that those things matter, and uh, it'll be a fun race down the stretch here. So, uh, as Bones mentioned on the weekend, he uh, wasn't too keen on uh, having the fellas have extra time in Nashville, and I'm pretty sure that decision was made during the East Coast road trip. Um, the team gets the win. They get back on the plane. Practice today. Um, fill us in on uh, what you saw down at practice today, how the team was prepping for the afternoon flight and tomorrow's game right here in Music City against the Preds. So there are really no lineup changes. Uh, the only player missing from practice was Nino Niederreiter, who Rick Bonus said after the skate is going to travel with the team for these next three games. So that's good news there. Um, he had the leg cut, the laceration, whatever word you want to use um, in the game. 
I forget how many games ago that was now, but they said he was going to miss a week, but now he's traveling. So that's good. He said he didn't know when he was going to skate, but as for lineup changes, nothing, the top line, still Euler, Shafley, Velarde, second line, Perfetti still on it uh, to fully still on that third line. And the fourth line that scored three goals against the wild is still together. Logan Stanley's with Dylan Sandberg on the back end. Morrissey and DeMello are together as well. I guess that's notable. But no real news coming out of practice except for Nino Niederreiter, who will travel with the team. Um, that being said, I mean, the uh, the team is, uh, I mean, listen, we kind of got everything out of the wild game and uh, everyone does their victory lap season sweep. Now it is off to uh, Nashville. And the one thing Rick did say after the game on uh, on Saturday afternoon, that you could tell he wasn't too pleased with is is uh, the power play. I mean, uh, were they working on special teams today? And uh, what tell us a little bit about just what you gathered from being there today about uh, the focus on improving, is particularly the man advantage. I mean, I'm not sure they're going to do anything different penalty killing wise. Although maybe try and be a little bit more aggressive. Mm-hmm. Easier said than done, depending on who you're playing right now. But that power play has uh, it's just not where it was. Certainly in that hot run shortly after Sean Monaghan became a Winnipeg Jet. Yeah, they were working on the power play today. Um, nothing really different. They're still running it through the bottom there with Velarde and in the bumper with Monaghan. On the second unit, actually, Perfetti and Ehlers swapped places. So Perfetti's now on the left wall. He can see the whole ice is on his forehand. It's kind of more of a facilitator role. And then Ehlers is on the right side, which is more like where Kyle Connor is on the top unit. Um, for one timers and things of that nature. I'm pretty sure that was flipped going back a few games. So that is something notable on that second unit. Um, and as for the top unit, yeah, they're still running it through the bottom, through Velarde, through Monaghan. They did score two power play goals against the Flames. They failed to score on the five minute man advantage. But having Velarde back, I have I have full confidence that the power play, maybe it won't be back above 30%, but I don't think it'll be an issue down the stretch here with Velarde back because he's just so dynamic at the side of the net there. And Rick Bonus has talked at length uh, across multiple games and multiple days about how much he changes the power play. So well, it's funny you de- bring up, you bring up Velarde. Um, mm-hmm. because needless to say, like, we spoke quite a bit about Velarde on Friday after the hat trick performance against the Calgary flames. It, it is just, uh, it is amazing, frankly, how good he looked right out of the gate. I mean, you recall yeah. Rick saying, well, we're going to probably give him 11, 12 minutes first game i think he was in excess of 18 right now and if anything he was playing some of his best hockey certainly getting some of his best results against the uh, calgary flames and to have a guy that you know certainly doesn't have the wear and tear on him from playing the full 80 game season really finding himself right now um, going into the postseason in these final very still important games in the central division a very very good thing for the winnipeg jets Yeah, he absolutely changes the dynamic of not only the power play, but this lineup in general. Um, Today, Rick was asked a few times about the struggles of the top line, and he said that they weren't generating enough, the top line being Ehlers, Shifley, Velarde. Um, I went back and looked before I hopped on here because my eye test couldn't disagree more with the top line struggling. Um, They've only scored one goal at 5-on-5, but regardless, they the past two games here against Calgary and Minnesota, they have controlled the shot share, the expected goals, all the analytics, scoring chances, everything. They haven't given up goals. They're controlling every analytic that you could ask for a line to control, a top line. Over the Jets' six-game losing streak, the duo of Connor and Shifley and whoever was on their wing controlled the analytical battle, the shot share, expected goals, whatever, one time in six games. And the top line has done it two games in a row. Velarde just had a hat trick. And they, if you remember the Alex Iafalo goal against Minnesota, that top line was in the offensive zone for, what, two minutes, cycling the puck, getting chances. Fourth line hops on and finishes off with a goal. So I I don't know. That was kind of the scuttlebutt today at practice that the top line was struggling, which I I don't see it. I just don't see it. I don't know about you, but that top I, line to me has been has been great. <laughs> oh, I, dude, I, I'm 100% with you on this. And, yeah. and, I mean, we spoke about it on Friday. And, listen, it was great to get the win. And credit to you for asking the question about it. And it was... I think we referred to it as a little bizarre that Rick was talking about how we wanted to see Cole and Nick work together and it didn't work. So we went back Um, like, Hey, listen, we're not going to get 100% truth bombs from Rick day after day after day. And Mm -hmm. I think when he is disappointed with particular players or particular results, 
he does everything he can to not air it out in the media. Although he also mentions, and we've heard many before, hey, everyone's all watching the game. We're all seeing the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's handling personalities. It's handling confidence levels of players. Um, but I would even argue that Kyle Connor has looked good and had a little bit more jump in his step since playing with, um, you know, with, uh, with on the Monaghan line. I 100% agree. And that Calgary game was hilarious. I had to ask about bonus or about the line change after the game, because if you watch the game and if you remember the Jets go up two one on that pass from Perfetti to Ehlers at that time, the Jets were controlling the game. Like they, they were dominating the flames, had all the, the shots, chances, everything you want. Then they, because of that pass, which Rick bonus said uh, warranted the switch, they go on with the lines of Connor Shifley, Velarde, and Ehlers, uh, Monaghan, Perfetti for the next, what, 20, 25 minutes of the game where the Flames absolutely dominate the, the Jets for the entirety of it. They end up tying up the game 2-2, and then they flip the lines back, and the Jets go on to dominate the rest of the way. It's like, what? So you come off a six-game losing streak, you beat L.A., and then one pass warrants a line change where you get dominated for 20 minutes, and then you switch it back, and you score three goals in the final in the third <laughs> period and go on to win. It's like, what are we doing here? And then and then the scuttlebutt is that the top line is struggling. I, I I don't get it. I just don't because the top line when they're together, you you can't deny not even the analytics, the real goals they're they're producing. And yeah, Velarde had a hat trick that game. Like I don't, yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> like um, you know, and 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 I'll, I'll say this and I, listen. Once we get to the playoffs, I'm sure at some point when things aren't going well. They'll change things up, and they can always go back to that. Um, but to be honest, games. that scares the hell out of me. I mean, thinking about going up against, because we know what Bender's going to do. Yeah. That line's out there, boom, going in. And listen, Ehlers <laughs> doesn't change it so significant that it's, in, you know, it's like going from zero to 100 on the other side of things. But the data shows us they spend way more time in the other team zone. Way more. But Ehlers is with that group, and that is a very, very good thing. Who's ever out against those that McKinnon line though is going to have their hands full. There's need no that doubt about it. And they're going to they're going to need to be ready. Well, listen, I think that extra game at a best of seven and starting off um, could be uh, could be very, very important when it comes to all of that. Um, we will get to uh, more chat about you know the lines and whatnot. Jeff Hamilton's going to jump on and uh, and join us coming up in a little bit. Um, but overall, a nice start to this road trip. And now it's off to Music City. Connor, before we go, uh, I have to ask you, did you take in the granddaddy of them all, WrestleMania, last night? I did not. But I heard that the the party that was was kind of crazy after. You brought up Morgan Wallen. Yeah, yeah um, Morgan Wallen. Got some... a, he was that excited yeah. about Cody Rhodes finishing the story. <laughs> he tossed a chair off of Chiefs. Uh, sixth floor, rooftop bar just down the street from where we were last night and ended up getting three felony charges. So though you're a big Morgan Wallen guy, you might want to have a talk yeah. with him, fill him yeah. in, you know, best behavior for the next little while. And uh, quite pleased that, uh, that nobody Fan of the her. music, not the guy, maybe. We'll, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> hey, just before we go, give a quick plug for the latest issue of Jets this week and how much more fun it was to do this oh. week than the last couple of episodes. <laughs> Well, the last episode, I, I joked that we've gone back to back weeks talking about 0 and 3 because they had the six game losing streak and it worked out perfectly. It was nothing but losses. But yes, it was very nice to talk about some wins. Uh, I threw a little twist on the hardest working jet this week. So go check that out. Um, and yeah, super fun. Episode 24. Next week will be 25. We've only got a few more um, given that they're almost done the season and the, the playoffs are right around the corner. But yeah, go check it out. It was it was super fun to put together with three straight wins to talk about. It, it was nice. You got it. Well, anyways, great stuff down at practice today. And uh, I know you'll be jumping on on Thursday. I'm planning on being back, uh, but you never know with travel and getting back in time. But uh, I'll be regardless, here. we'll have a chat about uh, the Dallas game and uh, looking ahead to the weekend with the Colorado Avalanche as well. Connor Rabchak, give him a follow on Twitter at Connor Rabchak1. He's number one in your hearts. And the, num the, the only one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, dude. You as well. See ya. Thanks for doing this. There's Connor Rabchak. And, uh, of course, if you're not following him already, you should be. Well, lots of great content, uh, both during games as uh, well uh, as what he's doing with us with Winnipeg Sports, talking on our socials as well. Um, we are going to welcome in the Hammer coming up in just a minute. 
Uh, but I do want to thank the great people of Princess Auto for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Of course, Princess Auto, an incredible Winnipeg success story, founded right here in Winnipeg, coast to coast, but still headquartered right here in Winnipeg as well. Two locations to serve you for uh, all those uh, incredible deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Spring is here. That list, I'm sure, is long. Everything to help you take care of that list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Again, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West. You can always shop online as well, 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. And with spring here, the fencing experts in town, Wallace and Wallace, are lining them up and getting ready for installation beginning at the end of the month. Uh, the orders are coming in right now. Folks, if you are looking to get a new fence for this summer, Wallace and Wallace for over seven decades has been the leaders in the industry here in Manitoba. But what you're going to want to do is book right now. If you do get booked by April 15th, Wallace and Wallace can guarantee installation by the end of May. So you and your family can spend a great Manitoba summer on your side of a brand new fence. Again, Wallace and Wallace, 452-2700. Give them a call right now. Get that order in by April 15th to ensure May installation from Winnipeg's fencing and overhead door leaders, Wallace and Wallace. Um, you know, we just had Connor on. I think we had some fun with this on Friday. Uh, but Connor was with us and before going up to the press box for the game on Thursday, looking like a million U.S. tax free in the new suit he got from F Apparel. Guys, if you are looking ahead to the changing, the wedding season and whatnot, uh, F has you covered. It's not just for suits, but they do have the best looking custom suits beginning at just 400 bucks. Uh, but they also got chinos, golf pants, and custom shirts, making you look great, made to fit, both tucked and untucked styles. For the best selection around of men's accessories. Pop by and see them at 190 Smith Street. You can also make an appointment to come in and get fitted or just find out more, including their 15% off discount for wedding parties online at F. That's E-P-H apparel dot com. And a big shout out to our friends at Aikens Lake who are getting ready to uh, get back out to the lodge for another incredible summer. If you're looking for a world-class fly-in fishing destination here in the province where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg, Aikens Lake is the spot. Go to AikensLake.com to find out more, all of their socials as well. Now, they are booking well into the second half of the summer right now. They do, I believe, still have one availability for Father's Day weekend if you're thinking about an amazing father-son trip or family a family trip in and around father's day talk to them about that and again if you got a fishing enthusiast in the family that would like to uh, spend the uh, summer in paradise and on the water helping people like me catch big fish that they'd never be able to do normally get a resume in to be a guide at Aikens Lake right now they're looking for a couple more of those all right Monday's just not Monday without a visit from Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press Let's get the hammer in here and uh, get things going. Hammer, what's up, buddy? How are you? Cross, not too bad, man. Just another wicked weekend in the rearview mirror. Looking forward to what's going to be another busy week here. Uh, lots going on this past weekend. I'd say the highlight was taking in the uh, live Kenny and Rennie show on, uh, on what would that day have been? Saturday. Um, that was really awesome. Got a chance to meet a lot of, a lot of great people. Uh, oh, live. Oh, they were down oh, at, uh, at they were TCB. Down at, at TCB. Yeah. So I was there for the game. I made, uh, I showed up a little bit. I showed up casually late and walked into what was an intimate room of hardcore Jets fans and got a chance to sit with them and chat with them and do the show and then chat more afterwards. It was awesome, man. There's uh, all the usual suspects there. You know, I, I, I know the list and I can say a bunch, but my fear is to, to miss one person. So, um, but it was how, awesome. was, how was Rennie? How was Rennie? The truth teller. Did he refer to himself as I am the national media again? Lots of people in the chat <laughs> having fun with that one from a few. Yeah, games I ago. think, I, I think he left to, uh, there goes the national media leaving. So they, <laughs> you know, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure how it, how it started, but I sure is. I sure know as 
<laughs> how it ended. And yeah, Sean's always great, man. And anyone, if, 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 there's no one who can work a room better than him. And you know, if he if he says a couple things that uh, that stick around a little bit longer, that get him in jest, it's just it's just part of the deal of being a good dude. So yeah, he put on a great show. Everyone was awesome. It was uh, it was really great to it was really great to be part of it chat with uh you know those those people know who i'm talking about you know i was talking to t will waiters bardo you know phyllis was there you know the the usual says i got to sit with jeff and bridget and glenn and darcy who was in from out of town so there's a lot of people tristan rivers i got a chance to talk to so it was just yeah it was again putting a lot of a lot of uh a lot of faces to the handles and uh you know people have really shown me a lot of support you know over the years and it's uh so it's it was really uh, it was really awesome to take that in and i look forward to doing more down the road Love it. I was actually with Rennie's tag team partner, Ken, last night here in Nashville, and we did take in WrestleMania. Did you see the main event? Did you see Cena, The Rock, The Undertaker come out and take out The Rock in the uh, the big main event that everyone is still talking about? No, but I heard some like I heard some radio stuff before, like The Rock is back or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like this is this is where I'm at, man. This is what, oh, yeah. you know, like you, I, I am not just recently, be your just yeah. recently. And so, yeah, like, I mean, to me, I, I know nothing about it. I knew I, from what I understand, it became a, it, it became a two day event. And I think I, yep. I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of who, was it your show that was, that was getting it? Or was it uh, another show? I forget. Oh, it was actually, you know what it was? It was the riser. It was the riser with Ted Wyman and Gregory Strong, their producer uh, was big into wrestling. And so he interjected into things. And I think that's where I kind of got a little bit of my, uh, primer if you will but yeah i was a huge man i was a massive wrestling fan growing up i uh, i had the luxury of of you know how big you know how big wigs the um you know the radio guys used to be back and they used to run the city you know and and so it was the, the tom and joe so tom mcgore and obviously joe l um i was really good friends with tom's son shay and shay and they had all the pay-per-view stuff so i was just a huge fan but then i went to <laughs> high school and i guess Somewhere in between chasing girls and other things, I uh, I left the uh, I left the real wrestling days behind me. But I, I love the energy and I I, I love the fact that it's a two day event now. Well, Were you in the it, scene of the crime? It's not. It wasn't in Nashville, was no, it? No, no, no. It was in Philly. Okay. It was in okay. Philly. We cool. just uh, we just went to uh, the uh, DraftKings has a. It's like a four. It's like the PBR bar is on one level. There's a rooftop bar. Yeah, not the yeah. one that Morgan Wallen threw the chair off last night. That was Chiefs just down the street. Um, uh, but I guess DraftKings branded is this place on the main floor, and they did a great job for uh, for uh, for hosting it. Um, so Ken came by, we watched it, you know, had a lot of fun. And well, it was Wyshynski. Wyshynski was on us uh, on the show last Wednesday, okay. and he's a big, big WWE guy. And he every year does this would have been perfect for you, the mm. lapsed fans guide to WrestleMania. So kind of filling people in on everything that's going on. But it was about five minutes where they had all of these stars come back out to have their little piece of the main event, including Cena and the rock who we knew was going to be there and the undertaker. Anyways, lots of fun. And uh, people are still, uh, still, t- still talking about it. Jet fans still talking about it. And I imagine you being with the group of the live K and R mm-hmm. were with some very happy jets fans because you can sweep a lot of teams and it's great. Something more special about sweeping your biggest rival. A lot of bad blood between the Jets and the Minnesota Wild over the last few years. And uh, a big win to start the road trip and get a little closer to Colorado. But that one, I think, meant a little bit more to a lot of Jet fans to do it and to dominate them all season long the way they did head-to-head. When I think that was one of my bigger takeaways from the, the victory. I mean, obviously... You know their their winning streak started off with a game against the Kings, and you know, and, and Calgary's not so great, uh, obviously, of a club. The Kings are certainly trying to you know carve their way into the playoffs, so that was a that was a meaningful game. But then this one here, I mean, this one was, I felt the Minnesota Wild would have a lot to play for, right? I mean, it's a team that, as you mentioned, doesn't want to get the season series swept by by the Winnipeg Jets, their their biggest rival, arguably. I, you know, I knew this game was going to be one of those games that the Jets didn't need to manufacture emotion and i think we saw that we certainly saw that from from deeper down in the forward lineup with the fourth line chipping in what three goals of the four and so you know i i thought that was you know i certainly some happy jets fans absolutely but also just you know i think up and down the lineup i mean they're i think the, the first line still trying to catch their footing here now ever since you know gabriel velarde has 
come back into the lineup. But overall, I thought that was you know a hard checking game and and back to back to the you know kind of fundamentals, uh, which I think is going to be the focus here over the last five you know four games remain in the regular season just get back to feeling good and stacking up those wins i certainly would add that uh, that minnesota game to the mix for sure you know just as a quick pause um we will continue this conversation what time is the eclipse happening is it like 208 like right now 208 yeah i was watching it outside a little bit i have those glasses it's tough to look if you don't have those glasses though well, I'm just saying we're. I've got the things closed so the lighting works and stuff like that. The in the room here, but like Nashville, and it was sort of cloudy a little bit this morning. So I don't know what it's like right now. Um, but I, in a moment, in about five minutes, I will take a look out and see what it's like outside because I think we are in an area of about ninety five percent. Oh, you're eclipse. almost on the pathway. Oh, yeah, gosh. yeah, very, yeah, r- r- very close. So we'll see if it looks a little darker outside. Uh, that being said, nice. it's looking. A, here's a great segue from a professional. It's looking a lot lighter for the Winnipeg Jets after three wins, considering where they were. Um, but they're now moving into some pretty tough territory on the road. Uh, but Jeff, I was saying this last week, and I'm interested in your perspective. I mean, the team knows where they're at. It has gotten interesting with Colorado losing a couple games. Oh, here Clips we go. Watch. W-E-T, Eclipse Watch, that's right. Um, This is a a great way to get ready for the postseason, Um, playing against legit playoff teams that all have a lot to play for right now as they try to, like many teams, raise their level of play to a point that um, they can make it happen uh, when they need to. And that's uh, the 83rd game of the season, game one of the playoffs. Well, and that's, you know, I go back to my original point from the last question. You don't need to manufacture, you know, you don't need to manufacture emotion for these games. These are against three teams, all of which are destined for the playoffs, all of which happen to be in your, in your division. And two in particular, well, one in particular, looks like the Jets are destined to play Colorado. We'll see, you know, who's, we'll see where that series starts. Uh, depending on who finishes second and third, of course. But um, this, these are the games where, and we, you know, this is a prime example of what I've said over and over and over again, us on this show, is that, you know, you, you, you have the ability to change the narrative around the entire team with this, you know, with the rest of this road trip. Now, it's not going to be easy. You're on the road. You know, you've already been on the road for a game, and, and what was an emotional, you know, it was a convincing victory, but it was still an emotional one, I imagine, for everybody to get up for that game. Um, not get up for that game, but to compete in that game and, and, and given the rival. And now you have three other games that are going to be intense. So this is going to be the closest thing you have to playoff hockey until you hit that 83rd game, as you mentioned, until you hit game one of the playoffs. And this is going to be a prime test. And this is going to be a prime opportunity that, you know, and I know people are going to look at this statement I'm about to make and maybe roll their eyes a little bit. I don't know if wins or losses matter as much in these next, you know, three games as much as the Jets compete level is, what they look like, what their structure looks like, how how, how they're attacking, how they're defending. This is, you know, these are teams, especially the Colorado Avalanche, that you're going to have to shore up a lot of those mistakes that you've made in the past. And against teams where, you know, like these next three that will make you pay. And they're going to, you know, these are the kind of teams that, won't you know don't give freebies they don't give free ice out there and if you look at you know you look at the dallas and colorado we all know how dominant they've been for stretches of the season well the nashville predators we also know have also been just as dominant might be one of the hottest teams going into the playoffs so this is a you know i don't know if you want to call it a measuring stick i think that's kind of nonsense to talk about at this game at this time of the year but this is the opportunity to have continuous battles against teams that you know are going to throw everything at you and we're going to find out what the jets are made of here um, and, and ultimately how they're feeling, how they're playing, hanging into obviously the most important part of the season. I'll, I'll say one thing. We've talked a lot about the depth of this team and you need everybody, uh, no passengers come playoff time uh, against whoever you're playing, but especially against a potential matchup against the Avalanche. The fourth line's ready to go. And we saw that in spades against the, sure. against the wild. The Adam Lowry line is as advertised all year long. Um, I, the big question right now is figuring out that top six as we get closer to it, and they're giving some more and more time. Oh, there's Indianapolis with the uh, – it's just about to go out. Fine. Oh, that is wild. Lights out in Indy, baby. If you're listening if you're listening to the podcast right now, this is uh, 
probably weird, so, but we're, we're, yeah. we're take us into the belly of the beast, Huss. Describe it. Use your we're looking, use your craft. We're, we're looking at a live shot. Okay, listen. I'll ask you this question. You can answer as I go for a live look. Um, thoughts on the top six working in the change on uh, the Calgary game that lasted about a period, not even um, when things went in reverse and changed right away. Um, but their performance on Saturday, but also moving forward into these games against Nashville, Dallas, and Colorado. You know, I don't think it's a great sign that um, you're trying to shore up your top six, but that's what the Jets are ultimately doing right now. They're trying to figure out what combination gives them, you know, the, the obviously the best recipe for success. And if you look at the line, I know that if you look at the top line and you look at the, you know, reuniting Gabriel Velarde and uh, Mark Shifley with Nikolai Ehlers. I know we haven't seen a ton of the results over the last two games, but I'm not in that camp that's looking to remove that because I already know with a larger sample size when, when Kyle Connor was with Mark Shifley, and I'm not saying that that's not going to potentially go back to I can almost guarantee at the first bit of struggle here, maybe down the stretch, for certainly in the playoffs, they're going to just reunite Mark and Kyle Connor, assuming that things go south or aren't, aren't, aren't happening. But at this point, I think you need to you need to wait it out. I, I think that chemistry we saw in December with that trio, I still think Gabriel Velarde, while you know, has certainly been impressive in his return to the lineup. He's added that boost to the to the power play, a much needed boost to the power play. Still gonna need more work on the power play, of course, but that was very tangible in his return. I still think he's getting up to game speed. So I still think we're waiting for Gabriel Velarde to feel comfortable at that five on five. And that's why I don't look at these last two games and um, you know, and, and see it as a you know major issue. Now that being said, they need to get Mark Shifley feeling really good come playoffs. I don't care, you know, you can go up and down the lineup. Mark Shifley needs to be the, your team's best player uh, come, you know, come playoff time. And I'm not suggesting that you're pulling out all the stops necessarily or adjusting things or putting back Kyle Connor with Mark Shifley if that's what he wants to make him feel good. But you need to get that line going. You need to get him going. Uh, you know, ever since that that three, you know, that hat trick against the New York Rangers, Mark Shifley has what? four assists in the last 10 games and if you look at the the last three games your last two games he's been on you've got one shot on net um that 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 isn't good enough but moving on from that line i like the second line kind of the way it's constructed obviously cole perfetti has taken advantage of his opportunity since being back in the line to be up with that group i don't know what happens with him of course when nino niederreiter comes back which sounds like it's probably going to be colorado um that's going to be a major decision for the Jets. Uh, to me, Huss, I don't make these decisions. So if you don't like what my opinion is on this, well, great news. Again, I don't make the decisions. But I don't know if I'm putting Cole Perfetti in the lineup um, if he's not on that second line. And if your plan right now is, of course, to put Nino Niederreiter back with that middle trio, uh, or sorry, the third, third, third line to be that shutdown line, it's obviously going to move Tyler to fully up to the second line. And I just don't know. And I'm not taking the game that we saw in Minnesota where we had, you know, where Morgan Barron, Domestikov and IXL follow just had a really great game against the Minnesota wild and saying, this is, you know, this is your fourth line. But the, the reality is, is what this team is asking of their fourth line, what they need from their fourth line is much different. And I like that trio, the way it's, you know, it's configured right now, even David Gustafson, not on that line. Um, I like it over a Cole Perfetti there. That being said, there's going to be injuries in in the playoffs. You're going to need depth. Um, I think you did get some you know some confidence from Cole Perfetti. He might even benefit from a little bit of load management, if you will, of coming in and out of the lineup, depending on what's happening. But I just see it as a tough situation for him when Nino Nito Ryder comes back. Because I, I I don't know about you, man, but I don't know where you put Cole Perfetti when you have that top nine, the way it's configured, and then, a, then a fourth line that's only going to get, you know, maybe 10 minutes, max 11 minutes a game if they even get to that. Um, and, and what they're asking for them to change, to be that hard on the puck line, to, to, to change some, like to play that role of changing momentum shifts. We know how, 
how many, you know, how many momentum shifts exist in the game. That's the power of the fourth line. If things are tipping in the opposite direction of the Winnipeg Jets, you want to put that line out there to be simple, to get the puck deep, to get in behind their defense, to 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 be physical. And of course, if you can add some offense to it, if you can generate offense essentially essentially off your defensive efforts, that's what the that's what the Winnipeg Jets need from the fourth line. And while Cole Perfetti, he's just not that guy to play that role. He's obviously a, has a high IQ. He can make plays that are probably better than that that true. But I think as a you know individually compared to those players, but I think as a group, you need that chemistry um, that we saw against the Wild. You need that kind of style of play, and I just don't think Cole Perfetti fits the bill for it. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because he has emerged at like at times he was the 13th forward um he's certainly the sl- six slash seventh guy in the top six mm-hmm. um and and listen for cole right now he's done himself a great service i mean he came in he took advantage of this opportunity and, and i do think he's you know he's built the confidence of the coaching staff in him with the way that he's played the last little while. Mm -hmm. Um, And listen, the Jets would love to be in the situation where they have to make a really tough call about somebody being in or out of the lineup. But to your point, I, I, to your point about the fourth line, like I have a hard time imagining Alex. I is not coming out of the lineup. He's the first guy over the boards with Adam Lowry come penalty kill. He's been consistent all year. And I think not coming out of the lineup. And Morgan Barron certainly isn't coming out of the lineup either. I mean, you can make an argument that Morgan Barron's a guy that deserves maybe a little bit more shot uh, above it. So, I, I mean, at this point, nothing is for sure. And we'll see whether they get to game one of this series in a couple weeks with everybody healthy. So, um, there is the possibility that he might not be in the lineup, but I will say this for him. He has shown that he's in a different place than he was with that epic struggle that went the better part of 20 plus games um, and is ready to go. And I think he understands his situation better. I think they've frankly done a very good job of putting him into the press box, talking with him, keeping the lines of communication open. And then when there's a chance for him to go in, put him onto the second line and some good things happen right now. Um, And I'll say this. Tyler Toffoli's looked really good at times. He hasn't at others. And mm-hmm. I mean, if he looked like he did on the second half of that road trip, then I think you're considering some other things, but he is a guy that has done it in the playoffs before. He's got a Stanley cup ring. He's got a lot to play for right now as a UFA going in. Totally. And I don't think that's lost on him. Um, so anyways, if we get to that point, it's very good problems to have. It might be tough for one player, whoever it is, that's not in the top 12 and in the lineup that night. Um, but it probably speaks to the Jets having their best possible chance of beating a team like the Colorado Avalanche. Well, that's the thing. Like, just file it under a good problem to have. I mean, I, I, it goes back to your point. Like, if, if you want Cole Perfetti to be in, who are you taking out? I mean, you could make the argument, I guess, Alex I follow, perhaps. I, I wouldn't make that argument. But, you know, I, I just think it, it's circumstance. As you mentioned, he's the 13th forward and the 7th essentially in the top six. And I, 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 I was tending to lean the same way as you have. So I'll just piggyback off that. I think that Tyler Toffoli is one of those guys that you might, depending on how he's doing, how he's feeling, there's always, you know, there's flu bugs that go through. That's ultimately what gave Cole Perfetti his opportunity back in the top six was a, was, was an illness. So, you know, those things are going to happen. You know, guys are banged up he's going to have to do what he essentially has been doing the last couple months. And that's being ready for the opportunity. And there's no doubt it's coming. It might not come as soon as he wants it. Of course, he's going to want to, you know, head out onto the ice for that game one, especially if it's in Winnipeg. But the reality is, is there's guys playing better hockey than you. You know, I, I think one of the other things too, is that we can't ignore the fact that, yeah, Cole, Perfetti, Cole Perfetti's had some success here the last few games, but there was a reason why he was taken out of the lineup. That consistency wasn't there. And so to just assume that, you know, it's going to come back in spades, I'm not saying it won't, but it needs to be under the right circumstance and opportunity. And, you know, if you're comparing a Tyler Toffoli with a Cole Perfetti, it's not even in the same conversation. I mean, as you mentioned, the Stanley Cup pedigree, the experience to play those games. But again, what will be very important, and mark my words, Cole Perfetti will be an important player on this team. He'll need to come in and perform ultimately and inevitably if and when 
you know, something happens to somebody in the top six. Yeah, I certainly hope that he gets in at some point. And, I mean, depending on what happens, I mean, if he's there in game number one, go out and make the most of it and make it hard for them to take you out of the lineup. I mean, that really is the totally. challenge for everyone. Um, That's what he's been doing right now. And listen, you know, the fact that we're having this conversation, if he's not having the success he's having over the last week, you know, we're just kind of waiting for Nino Niederreier to come back and, you know, whatever, or, or he's playing on that third line. I mean, that's that's a testament to his what he's been able to do since coming back in there. Well, and, and and listen, and coaches talk all the time about roles. Um, Maurice did all. I mean, the guys on the fourth line, I'm looking at them. They need to be able to kill penalties or do some other things that we're going in. If there's a spot in the top six, Cole Perfetti is, in my opinion, a better choice than I, Alex Iafallo. Although Alex Iafallo so. has, you know, like, when he has been up there, he has produced at times, he certainly added a different element to that group to sort of get the puck to the the uh, Shifleys and the Connors. The water beetle out there. Um, exactly. But, I mean, if we're talking about the fourth line role, um, I am with you. I mean, that is something that is more in the toolbox of a Baron, of an Iafalo, as much as you would consider it. But, I mean, it wouldn't be bad to have some more pop on that fourth line. But, I mean... What happened on Saturday isn't going to happen each and every game. It certainly would be nice to happen a couple times in the playoffs. And if you can get some scoring from that fourth line, that is big. Um, and who knows, Huss? I mean, let's let's fast forward to the playoffs, if we will. If things aren't working out in the first couple of games, and you're oh, not yeah. getting, then he's probably on the fourth line. You know what I mean? He probably gets moved into the lineup regardless. There's still an opportunity for him to crack that fourth line. It's just all things equal. If all things are working well, he's ideally not there. You know, um, and listen, we can talk about the fourth line and Perfetti and all that, but I want to go back to something that you talked to about Mark Shifley. Mm -hmm. And I could not agree more. I mean, maybe the most important thing over these last five games of the season is to see Shifley's level of readiness to go up against top competition. And I don't know if you saw any of the avalanche oiler game yeah. on, I guess it was Friday. Um, you know, there was a few great Twitter clips of just isolation on those guys going head to head. Right. And I mean, it was a breakneck speed going both ways. They were both very close to each other playing that. And all I was thinking about is, whoa, this is going to be one of the biggest challenges of Mark Shifley's career, um, particularly on the road. Like, let's assume that it's Denver. We have seen Jared Bednar, the second he sees that line going over the boards, Boom, it's McKinnon time. Right. McKinnon, who very likely I would think is probably the favorite for the Hart Trophy right now. Um, yeah. Shifley's sure. ability to go, and again, we can talk about scoring and all that. Um, listen, if you can if you can stay even with the McKinnon line, you're ahead of the game right now. Um, and it's easier said than done, but that challenge is going to be right at the top of the list of all of the storylines going into a potential Jets Av series as to how, when in Colorado, when they don't have the change to put the Lowry line out against Nathan McKinnon, can the Mark Shifley line keep their heads above water? Can they keep the puck? Can they maybe spend some more time in the offensive zone? And I think that's a big reason why there's a lot of optimism that the change with Ehlers and Connor after you know so many ugly nights from the shot share, the goal shares from that group, might be able to do a better job of, uh, of, you know, being as close to level as possible against arguably one of the, if not the top line in the league. Well, and that's it. I mean, I don't think you can look at, of course, we're talking about uh, the games in this case would be in Denver for the last change. They're not going to be playing ball with you to get uh, the Adam Lowry line to play against that group. Cause we've seen that in the past this season, we've seen how well they've done. Um, but at the same time, I think, what are you, what are you asking of Mark Shifley's line when they're up against, you know, Nathan McKinnon's line? Essentially, you're asking them to be at a net zero. You know, I, you know, I, you would, I, you would ideally want them to outscore, um, McKinnon's line, but I think it's a lot to just battle out or again, if they score, you score one. I think you'd feel a little bit better if the power play was going, because those are kind of the things you look at as complementary pieces that if you can battle to a, you know, an even score against that line, hopefully your power play can take you places. We haven't seen that from the Winnipeg Jets power play essentially all season long, but that is going to be the biggest challenge. And this is where you, you know, this is where you make, you know, you make a name for yourself is the playoffs is going up, you know, it's fairly or unfairly. They're going to pin 
Mark Shifley versus Nathan McKinnon. They're going to be compared, much like they're going, like they compare goaltenders, where they compare stars of each team. And Mark Shifley needs to be that star. He needs to be that 2018, you know, impactful player who is driving play, who's making his, you know, who's who's finishing plays, who's making his line mates better. Like all those things that Mark Shifley can be and wants to be. This will be, you know, his opportunity to showcase, you know, showcase that, his ability to win series. I mean, of course, you're going to need other people to help you out, particularly Connor Hellebuck. We all know the importance of him, uh, you know, this spring and, and getting the Jets to where they want to get. But Mark Shifley needs to be feeling good and looking good. And, you know, we just haven't seen that over the last X amount of games, particularly over the last few. I mean, he's not even getting, you know, shot opportunities, let alone shots on net. And so he needs they need to find a way to get him involved and get him going because, you know, whether it's Colorado Avalanche in the playoffs or if it's just this next three games, the challenge isn't getting any easier. And we're and he's going to need to figure out a way to get through whatever it is he's getting through um, because the Jets need him more than anybody because he's by far their team's best player. Jeff Hamilton from the Winnipeg Free Press with us here. Hammer, um, before we go, We've got Bob Harry coming up. Really looking forward to that conversation. Um, it is Masters Week. Have you made any sprinkles yet on the board? And do you have any? Uh, do you have any leans? Do you have any early picks uh, for uh, the big event this weekend in the Green Jacket? Google's Masters favorites, twenty twenty four. Um, <laughs> it's Scotty Scheffler, uh, the shortest number since Prime Tiger Woods at like plus four fifty most places. You know, I'd, I'd just be talking that in my can at this point. Huh? So I'm not. You know, like I'm not. I'm a guy who has a couple buddies who have their pulse on 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 golf, including yourself, who who sprinkle, you know, seem to wit seems to be a, a sport though that if you can get pretty good at it, you can make some major cash at. So it's just something I've never really I love the Masters. It's a sign of summer. You know, I know it's in April, but like it feels like a sign of summer. It feels like we're we're, we're turning season. So I always love Masters time, but I'm not going to sit here and uh, and give any advice to to your viewers. Uh, you know, who might who may just I would imagine they don't take my advice on a lot of things, but who who would happen to risk and may just take your advice on this one? I'm going to leave it out. But I'm looking forward to what's a great great group and a, and essentially like uh, you know a great weekend of golf. Well, I can't promise anything, but the Wednesday lock shop is going to be a banger with our final picks. And considering uh, yours truly had 20 bucks on Akshay Badia at 50 to one on the weekend, um, we're, we're hot at the right time. I will say that heading into it. We'll get to the cool vet lines a little bit later on, but uh, very, nice. very much looking forward to the tourney. Um, but first things first. Tomorrow night, right here in Music City, Jets and the Preds as they uh, continue this road trip. Hammer, awesome stuff. Anything you want to plug or tease that the folks can look forward to coming up in the Winnipeg Free Press? No, just keeping my head down. I've been doing a lot of things behind the scenes. It's going to. Uh, it's not going to be quite the immediate release, but we'll, something will be coming out in the ensuing weeks and months from now. So I've just been keeping my head you know, down on that. Looking forward to CFL coming in. Of course, keeping an eye on those Winnipeg Jets as they – they have this season, but uh, yeah, some, some exciting stuff coming up, but uh, nothing that I can overly reveal at this point, but uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Good stuff, buddy. Uh, hey, listen, thanks as always. Uh, great to have you on the program, and uh, we will look forward to uh, catching up on Monday. We'll talk about who won that green jacket, and we'll have two home games before uh, the Jets get going the following weekend in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Have a great one, dude. Right on, Haas. Thanks for having me on, buddy. See you next week. Beauty, there is Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press. Hey, speaking of the playoffs, gang, you know what's coming up, the whiteout. And, uh, of course, the Jets continue to work very hard behind the scenes to build up their corporate base, um, as well as get back some fans that had packages before that, for whatever reason, didn't this year. Now's the time to get to winnipegjets.com slash deposit. Get your deposit down on a package for next season and book your priority playoff tickets for uh, what hopefully will be a really fun and long run. There's no guarantees, especially considering this division and how tight it is with three teams now over the 100-point mark, including the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, but it has been an amazing season for the club. It should be an amazing atmosphere down at Canada Life Center. You wanna, you're going to want to count yourself in on that. And again, if you are thinking about a package, Get the deposit in now and get those playoff tickets before the games are out and individual tickets go on sale. <clears throat> um, cheers to our friends at Little Brown Jug. And I know 
Little Brown Jug, big supporter of women's sports and so many other things in our community. Uh, I did regret not being able to go down yesterday and watch that women's NCAA hoops final. Uh, I did a little shindig there at LBJ yesterday. Uh, people enjoyed some generic lagers and 1919s as well as a bunch of new beers. They're brewing and getting ready on on tap at the uh, brewery and tap house for the weekend. Shout out to South Carolina, undefeated season, incredible team. And of course, Caitlin Clark, what a career, um, what an impact she had on not just women's hoops, but I think women's sports in general. And I think a very bright future for the WNBA with the star power that is going in along with, of course, Angel Reese from uh, from LSU. Um, Little Brown Jug is the spot to uh, enjoy patio time and the best local beers in town. Pop by and see him in the exchange, William Avenue, right by the Red River downtown campus. <laughs> I got to thank our friends at Royal Sports. We're all geek for the playoffs. Uh, that means you better get your whites ready to go. And if you do need to upgrade your whites for the Jets playoff series, Royal Sports is it the biggest and best selection in town when it comes to Winnipeg Jets merchandise, literally thousands of pieces ready for you and ready to go. And listen, springtime doesn't just mean playoff hockey. It also means soccer, baseball, softball, tennis, new stock coming in daily at Royal Sports. Head on down there, 750 Pemina Highway, and make sure to check out their Instagram feed and give them a follow at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And with the Jets on the road... Tomorrow night, Thursday night, Saturday, you know where the best place to be to watch the game, to watch the team on the road, get ready for the playoffs. It's your local Boston pizza, ice cold schooners, world famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and the big screen with big sound with Winnipeg Jets hockey. And don't forget those fun Jets pick a player contests at your local BP. And hey, if you're staying at home, you can also always order online at bostonpizza.com. Uh, I am so looking forward to this next conversation. Uh, we had Bob Herrig on the last time he put out a book, which was about Tiger and Phil. Uh, we've got the Masters this week, and he's got a brand new book, Drive, The Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods, back in the field at Augusta, five years from his historic victory. He's the current golf writer for Sports Illustrated, longtime ESPN golf writer. And Bob Herring joins us now on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Bob, it's great to have you back on the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, you know, man, there is so much to talk about. And I do want to get to Tiger and the book as well. Um, but holy smokes, what a weekend. I mean, you know, every now and then that Valero Texas Open gives us an incredible story of a young player or a player that wasn't qualified for the Masters. Um Akshay Badia was incredible all weekend long, but he had to dodge a nuclear Denny McCarthy on that back nine who was trying to make history of his own yesterday before almost inexplicably putting one in the drink and actually got it done. What a show at Valero to get us ready for the big one this weekend in Georgia. Yeah, it's always fun to know somebody in here at the Masters. Um because it's the last chance, you know, and it's the only way you're going to get in at that point is to win. There's no other avenue. There's no rankings anymore. There's no money lists or what have you. And so um, it was it was win or, or go home as far as the Masters are concerned. And uh, and Badia pulled it off. And, and look, he didn't really play that bad down the stretch. You know, he had a big lead. He had, you know, a four or five shot lead at the turn. And but like you said, Danny McCarthy, like – he had an unbelievable putting week. He had an incredible stretch there. Uh, he tied a, t- a tour record for fewest putts over 72 holes, 92 putts. Uh, and then, like you said, it was kind of a strange uh, occurrence there, the way the way he hit his his third into the water there on eight on uh, 18 or in the playoff. But um, you know, good for Badia. He's here and um, getting to play in the Masters, and that's. Brings the field to 89 players, which is a good number by threes, uh, like they like to have, and uh, and uh, we'll see, you know, if he can roll it over into this week. But Bob, are you at Augusta right now? Yeah, I'm in the I'm in the media center right now. Yeah. Oh my God, this is amazing. I mean, just to just to have you here and talk about this, and and you know, Tiger is going to be front and center on the weekend 
or on the week or hopefully the weekend, I think for, uh, for golf in general, um, how much of the conversations today, Tuesday, Wednesday, are not just about the most prestigious tournament on the planet, but the state of golf today. I heard some interesting, you know, stuff from the live guys last week when they were in Miami, Bryson DeChambeau and, um, you know, some of them talking about, well, things need to get figured out because uh, fans are leaving the game. I mean, I think everyone realizes that. Um, what do you make of just where things are at right now with these two tours, the damage that's being created within golf and, you know, what the top players are saying coming into this tournament in regards to uh, the future of the sport at the pro level? Yeah, it's an inevitable topic of conversation. This is the first time everybody's all back together. Uh, since the British Open last July. I mean, uh, uh, you know, except for a guy like John Rahm who didn't join, and Terrell Hatton who didn't join Liv until after after the season ended. Uh, but, uh, you know, a guy like Bryson, a guy like Brooks Kepka, those guys haven't played with Rory McIlroy, you know, since uh, the Open in England. So, uh, and and I think we've all gotten to the point, they have gotten to the point, fans have gotten to the point, We'd like to see these guys play together a little bit more than just the majors, you know, and, and how do we get there? It's a, it's a big topic of conversation. You know, there's a big segment of people that think, Hey, look, they didn't have to leave. You know, we, that we wouldn't have this issue if these guys didn't leave and go to live. But on the other hand, they did leave and go to live and what they, by doing that, believe it or not, they, they impacted all of golf money wise. Like, all the players on the PJ tour should probably be thanking them because the ones who weren't going to go anyway are getting enriched greatly. Now, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, the persons have gone up. These signature events are big money tournaments. The stars are getting guaranteed money to show up at these tournaments. Um, but we don't have them all playing together all the time. And how do we get to that point? What, what has to happen? Is there an alternative format? Is there allowing some live guys to come back to the PJ tour? Is it, you know, a Champions League or a Formula One type situation. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas. Does live exist as it is? Do they have teams still? I mean, so many factors to consider, and it's it's uh, it's really a tough task for those who who are in charge of making it work. Well, and, and I mean, I guess from my perspective, you know, as a big fan of the game, I mean, listen, it's great. These guys are they were already making lots of money. They will all have generational wealth, in all likelihood, the top players. The fans are the ones that have been getting screwed. And I'll be honest, I took it. It sounded a little disingenuous for the guys that left for the money to then be saying, well, guys, um, you know, hey, like, look what's, what's happening to viewership and the fans. People have never really gotten into live overall. Some people will be for the most part. The tour is bleeding fans right now. I mean, it's hurting everyone except for the accountants and the agents, I guess. And. Um, I mean, I really don't know what the answer going forward is, but at what point do they think, like, will the decisions ever be made in the best interest of the game and the fans that really make it, or will it always be on the size of the checks? Well, you know, the live guys will say that was in the best interest of the fans because they're bringing the game around the world to places that are underserved. And there is some, I think there is some validity to that. Um, you know, we're, here in North America, we're, we're sort of insulated. We're used to seeing them on TV. It's in our time zones. Um, people in Australia never get to see a guy like Bryson DeChambeau or Dustin Johnson. And so, like, when Liv goes there, it's a huge deal. They're mad at the PJ Tour for not going there or for robbing them of their own players from coming home because of the year-long schedule. I get that. That makes some sense. On the other hand, your point is, your point is well taken that, you know, the divide wouldn't be here if these guys hadn't left. Or you could take it farther back. There wouldn't be a divide if maybe the powers that be four or five, six years ago had recognized that this was possible, that this was coming, and they needed to head it off. Uh, you know, there were threats of arrival out there for a long time, and I think the PGA Tour leadership didn't take it seriously. They, they didn't think it would it would get off the ground like it has. Well, now it has. And so, like... I think it's important for people to stop saying, well, they shouldn't have done it. If they, if they wanted to bring it back together, they shouldn't have left. Well, they did leave and they're playing and live as plans to go on in the next year. Um, if we want to get them all back together, I think both sides need to sit down and figure it out. 
No doubt about it. Bob Herrick's with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. And this is sort of a, a nice segue into talking about Tiger and the book. Um, but wh- where is Tiger? I know he was at that meeting in the Bahamas last week. He's the most influential person in the sport. Yeah. Um, what's Tiger's role in all of this? And uh, can he be some sort of an agent of change to bring things together um, for positive results for the for the fans and the customers that eventually foot the bill. Yeah, Andrew, I think there's a there's a good a good argument to be made that Tiger is not in favor of bringing the PIF, the public investment fund, on board. Um, he's he's not said that publicly since he's been part of the PJ Tour policy board as a player director. He's sort of taken the neutral stance, but there's some indications that he's been he's been standing in the way of it. Although he did meet with the head of the PIF. Yasser al Ramayan a couple weeks ago in the Bahamas, they actually played golf together. Whether or not that created any ability, you know, maybe maybe there was any bonding or any any sense of togetherness is unclear. Um, but Tiger's going to have a big role in this. You know, his opinion matters. And Tiger, look, Tiger is – it's hard to blame Tiger for wanting to make sure that the PGA Tour remains intact. A lot of some of these ideas would diminish the PGA Tour. You know, there would there would be less tournaments probably. There, if, if you're going to have this secondary concept like a like a, a Champions League that they all funnel into, there can't be as many PGA Tour events. There can't be as many live events because you got to allow a guy's time to play in those. You know, Tiger's legacy is tied to winning 82 times on the PGA Tour and playing across a lot of the same cities. And venues that Sam Snead played when he won 82 times, you know, Pebble Beach and Riviera and Torrey Pines and Sawgrass and uh, you know a lot of these venues are, are are historic. They've been used forever and ever. You know, the Colonial and Fort Worth. I mean, so I think Tiger is trying very hard to preserve that, and I think there's some, you know, there, there there's some, uh, you know, I, I I get that. There, it, it makes sense, but. But it, I think he also has to recognize that the game is in a totally different place. And if you don't try to work with these guys, are you going to still risk losing more players to live and diluting the product even more? I mean, that's what they're faced with. Bob, um, well, while we're talking Tiger, I and mean, we've got to get to uh, your uh, your book. Uh, the new one is called Drive the Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods. And what a perfect time to come out with this five years from – not, not just golf, one of the, the most memorable scenes in sports history when he shocked the world, I think is safe to say, in winning that Masters in 2019. Um, tell us about the book and, uh, you know, t- Tiger's impact just at the Masters five years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think you can argue recency bias might be part of this, um, but I think you can argue that Tiger's win here in 2019 was his greatest victory. Uh, it, it's it'd be it's a fun debate certainly. I mean, you know, his first Masters win was incredible. His his U.S. Open win by 15 in 2000. His U.S. Open win on one leg at Torrey Pines. I mean, those are all in the discussion. But Tiger back in those days was expected to do well. He was he was so great, right? Well, in 2019, not so much. He was two years removed from very serious back surgery. I I get into the kind of the the backstory of that and, and, and how much distress he was in and what he had to do and, you know, how difficult a spinal fusion is, especially for a golfer. But in the reporting of that, it, it became clear to me that, you know, his legacy is, is not just about his great skill, talent and talent. It's about his, his incredible drive, you know, his resiliency. He doesn't quit. And, and I basically have a whole book full of examples of that. His cut streak of 142, um, you know, the way he reacted after he, he shot his highest score ever, an 85 at the Memorial in 2015. And he came back the next day and he and he, he gave it everything. You know, he played like he was trying to win, even though he was in last place by five or six shots. You know, he the thing is, is Tiger's had his moments too, just like everybody. Like, it's not always going well for you. And Tiger's always found a way to fight through it. And and I think coming back to win that Masters was, was maybe the greatest example of it. What uh? What are your expectations about Tiger uh, for this week? Like where he's at right now, and big picture. And I'm sure this is touched on in the book. As a father, we've seen these incredible scenes of his young son Charlie, who looks like a chip off the old block. Um, mm-hmm. you know how influential is the development of him 
in keeping Tiger going and trying to win more green jackets and playing with the best in the world? I think there's something to be said for Tiger wanting to set an example for his kids, you know, wanting them to be able to see him compete at the highest level. Um, I, I think that gives him incentive uh, keep, to keep playing well and to keep competing is probably a good example for Charlie, who's trying to compete now, you know, at 14 or 15 years old. Uh, the expectations this week, I think they have to be tempered. I mean, you never say never with Tiger, but he's played 24 holes in 24. You know, he, he withdrew six holes into the second round at uh, Riviera back in February with, with the flu. And we thought he'd play last month in Florida, and he did not. Um, that was not a great sign. I mean, why not? Like, we don't know. Like, was it because your game wasn't ready? Was it because your back was bothering you, your leg? Uh, I, I get the sense that it might have been his game wasn't ready, and he didn't want to take any chances. Well, if you don't want to take any chances, what, you, what were you worried about? Because, because, frankly, you need the reps to be prepared to play here. Uh, now, he, he came here Sunday um, got around and just chipped and putted on the on the course. He he was out there this morning, played a practice round with Will Zal Torres. Actually looked pretty good. You know, Tiger's moving pretty good. He's hitting a lot of really good iron shots. But I mean, it's practice. It's nine holes. It's not it's not the tournament. It's not an eighteen hole round. It's not seventy two holes, which we've not seen him do for a while. He did play seventy two holes in the Bahamas in December. Flat golf course, eighty degree weather. Um, you know, that was a good sign, and it gave us hope that he might play a little bit more. So far, we haven't seen it, and I just think it's a lot to ask him to be as sharp as you need to be, especially at a course like this. The book is Drive, The Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods, available wherever you get books. Highly recommend it. And, Bob, just on the way out, I mean, the last time we had the pleasure of uh, you joining me on the program, we were talking about your book, Tiger versus Phil, like the, the incredible rivalry in those two just have to ask you how as someone that's covered both of them but phil for a long time um you're back at augusta right now phil's a master's legend um but he's had a few years that have been you know, tarnished him a little bit in the eyes of some obvi he's sure. on the live tour how different is the phil show at augusta in 2024 than it was five and ten years ago yeah, it, I, I would say it's probably a little bit subdued, a little bit more subdued. Not terribly so. He's still revered around here. and Obviously, he's won the Masters three times. But there's no question that Phil really put his, his legacy at risk with this move because, um, you know, in 2021, he could have rode off on that when he won the PGA Championship at Kiowa. Became the oldest major champion. He won a sixth major. He actually won a major after Tiger. And he's older than Tiger. I mean, he kind of one ups Tiger, you know, and um, he could have rode that forever. He could have probably been in the TV booth right now. He could be doing corporate outings. He played in a Champions Tour. He'd still be playing on the PJ Tour, be playing in all the majors. He, and, and, and he could have become like kind of a, you know, a, an elder statesman, frankly, you know, a very well received elder statesman. Instead, there's going to be a segment of people that will never forgive him for doing that. Um, you know, just they, there's people that just hate the whole idea of going to live. They think it was greedy. Um, you know, why did you need to do that? They don't know all the reasons. They talk about the gambling. So it's, um, it, it's, it's a little bit complicated for Phil these days. But look, the, he came back last year and the place brought out the best in him. He shot 65 the final day and tied for second. You know, uh, he hadn't shot 65 here in 20 years. You know, I mean, it was, you know, phenomenal final day. And if he hadn't had a bad Saturday, he might have been in the mix. It is, uh, it is just, I mean, those two, and I mean, the book was, was so amazing for many reasons, but as icons of the game and to bring it all back to Augusta where they all play um, in this new world that we're living in, is uh, well, it's certainly going to add to the uh, to the intrigue again. Bob, cannot wait to read Drive: The Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods. Thank you so much for the time and uh, enjoy what hopefully will be another great tournament down in Augusta. That would be great. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Have a great day. Appreciate you. There is Bob Herrig. Uh, man, we're gonna I'm gonna get into this as soon as I get back. Drive: The Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods. Um, real, I mean, just thanks again to uh, the folks that helped us out get Bob on the show today. And uh, it is showtime on Thursday. 
But, you know, some of the other things that we were talking about, I mean, the state of golf right now, um, in, in some, I, nothing will overshadow um, the Masters. But we're going to see these top players that chose to leave and take the bag from the Saudis um, going up against the guys that are still carrying the torch on the PGA Tour uh, on Thursday. And for folks that, I mean, many of them probably haven't watched the whole of golf this year and didn't even care to. And it's the Masters. They're going to tune in. Um, but I think people will realize how much the split has just diminished the health of the sport amongst the fans. They might all be getting paid more. They might be getting a ton of cash. Um, but it's it's not healthy for where golf is. And as Bob mentioned, I mean, few better people to talk to than him. Um, there's no easy answers for this. And um, there's no clarity as to where this goes from uh, from here. Um, we're going to talk more about the tournament tomorrow with Feinberg, one of our favorites. We'll look to uh, do another segment on the Masters towards the end of Wednesday's show, I'm sure. And then Thursday and Friday, game, uh, rounds one and two, we'll see who's playing on the weekend. And next Monday, a week from today, we'll be talking about another green jacket handed out uh, for the Masters champion. Um, you know, when we do, uh, uh, you know, when we talk golf on the program, we always do it for our friends at Breezy Bend Golf and Country Club. Um, I, as much as this is the time of year where everyone, especially if you're from Winnipeg, you're watching the Masters and realize the snow's gone or should be gone or usually is gone. We're going to be on the course real, real soon. Uh, if you want more information about uh, get on the waiting list at Breezy Bend, uh, booking events like weddings and more, Go to breezybend.ca, and we'll hopefully see you out at the links. Looking forward to doing a show or two out at Breezy, and uh, more looking forward to getting out of playing at Breezy uh, coming up this year. Um, let's uh, get Remus back in here because it is time to, uh, well, speaking of the Masters, get to the cool bet lines. We may have to look at where the uh, the odds are right now for the uh, for the big event. Um, Reem, I did, by the way, set up our DraftKings contest, which is open right now. I haven't set my lineup yet, but I am in. Uh, I know a lot of people that maybe don't normally play in the hockey events want to make sure they get in on the Masters. So uh, fill people in if they want to go into our little $3 contest, how they can do that and uh, get involved and uh, and play with us on the weekend. Sure. I'll put a link in the chat right now, but I'll also put one in the description of the YouTube channel and the description of the podcast, or if that doesn't work, for you, just um, send a message, send an email on our website, social media, sports.wpg. Uh, I'll help you out, get in there. So here's the link for DraftKings League. What do we do? Three dollars, fifty people. It's pretty fun, and I don't. Know, I suck at the golf. I'm okay at uh, hockey and CFL, NFL, golf. I don't know anything about like how. Like, I don't know, like, what's, like, greens in round and what's, there's all these, like, greens golf Greens in regulation. Yeah, greens in regulation. There's all these, like, terms for how to figure out if a guy is good on a certain course that's, I just haven't looked into. There's too many. Well, there's yeah, lots. Too many I mean, I will say this. If you really want to, you know, want to geek it out, I mean, mm -hmm. um, whether it comes to making bets at Cool Bet or doing a DraftKings contest with us for the, uh, for the DFS when you're picking your four guys, um, there, this is the one tournament where rest assured, it will not take you, uh, very much to find some great information. I'll shout out our pal, Pat Mayo. Um, he and Feinberg have, uh, incredible, incredible, uh, conversations. I mean, it's a fun podcast, but Pat in particular, I believe his master's research is already out. So checked out at Mayo media network. And, uh, I think a simple Google search will show you no shortage of, uh, of info, to make your picks. Um, speaking of cool bet, let's get to our cool bet lines. And you know, Pat sent me a uh, a a message, and I'm going to retweet this right now. But they are doing um, a few a few cool uh, things. And if you go to at Cool Bet Canada on Twitter, is the best way to do this. Um, but you can earn points when you win bets on all four major golf majors this season. And again, that starts with the Masters. And um, there's also another one where they've got some really neat uh, some prizes that are going to be given away for uh, for making winning bets on the Masters right now. So at Cool Bet Canada on X, that's where you'll find the details of these contests. And uh, again, hit the promo tab as well when you get over 
to um, when you get over to uh, over to Coolbet. And I will tell you, Remo, I know you saw my excitement last week as we had like that incredible week, like hitting everything hockey wise. And I said, that's going to be a week in the lock shop that probably will never be duplicated again. And then it got even better as I went through the ultimate sweat yesterday of Akshay having to deal with Danny McCarthy going nuclear with seven straight birdies, but winning in a playoff for a 50 to one winner coming right into Masters week. It could not, it could not have gone any better. And I hope I didn't use up all our luck for all of 2024 in the past week. Yeah, a bit of a heater. And part of that was uh, the guaranteed win night on Thursday for the Jets against Calgary, where yep. it was Morrissey, Shafley, Velarde, Ehlers, and Jets win in regulation. That was uh, definitely the highlight to hit that one on WST night. So, yeah, you guys have been hot. I've been here about it all week. How did your uh, WrestleMania picks do? I know, I still the think Roman Reigns plus 200 was was good val even if he didn't yeah, win yeah i mean i i went um it was two of three on that one i did have a uh i had a jay uso street profits bobby lashley parlay that came through oh which nice. Was nice um let's see i had one with bailey jay uso there was a couple ones but the one that i put out which was jay uso rhea ripley and Roman Reigns didn't come out. And listen, I kind of should have known, even though the odds were changing more in Roman's favor. I mean, you'd been telling me the whole time, it's time to finish the story. It was. And uh, I guess they finished the story. It finally happened. Kudos to them for uh, for making all that uh, all that work. Um, but we move on from WrestleMania to the the Masters week, which was one of the biggest weeks of the year. And of course the Stanley cup playoffs coming up. And one other thing that hasn't been, hasn't come through, but we talked about it. We got it listed on cool bet and bet it last week was the Pittsburgh penguins to make the playoffs at plus 600. And uh, don't look now, Reem, but the Pittsburgh penguins have passed a bunch of teams. They've got the Leafs tonight as a plus 136 underdog Leafs at home, minus 161. Sid's got 40 Ned and net has won four in a row. I think and the Penguins are hot, and I actually think that they're going to finish the story and get Malkin <laughs> and, and and Crosby and all of them into the postseason in this incredible, uh, incredible race right now that no one seems to want to win except for Pittsburgh. Yeah, they're hot, and Crosby was just named Star of the Week. Uh, they've, they've really turned back the clock here. Uh, Crosby, Malkin, Latang, and this Metropolitan Division has is so... Bad. You have the Rangers at 110 points, Carolina 105, both very good teams. But then in third place, you have the Islanders at 85 points. And then Detroit's in the wild card right now at 84. But for all these other teams, they could either catch the Islanders in third in the Metro or get that last wild card spot. I'm talking about Pittsburgh, 83 points, Capitals, 83 points, and the Flyers, 83 points. And the Flyers have played one more game. They've really... Um, well done horribly over the last pitch. They're two, five, and three in their last ten two game losing streak. They've lost to what Montreal and Columbus. Like they've it's been there for the taking, and they're really having this epic collapse here. So I think Pittsburgh is gonna get in. I'm curious about the Islanders and Detroit. Who takes who takes a spot here? And does one of them even catch does Pittsburgh get in a wild card or do they catch the Islanders? The Pittsburgh there's four, four, and two. They've got head-to-head -head games. Or sorry, 6-2-2. Two two. They do have head-to-head -head games against the Islanders? I don't yeah, know the and, schedule. And I think the Red Wings. And I think the Red Wings as well. And then other than that. But, I mean, they beat Tampa on Saturday. That was really tough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pull this up right now, actually, while we're talking about it. Um, the Penguins on Saturday beat Tampa. We're going to hit their schedule here. And Pittsburgh is finishing up. They're at the Leafs tonight. Yes, home against the Red Wings on Thursday. Huge game. Home against the Bruins on Saturday. Home to the Predators on Monday. And then they finish up their season at the Islanders in game number 82. That could very well be for third place in the Metro. Um, and again, Philly's sort of just taking on water right now. They'd been in that spot for the last three months, it seems. Um, but uh, it would be an amazing story. I mean, they were left for dead 
And um, it was funny. We saw The Undertaker last night at WrestleMania while Sidney Crosby is pulling an Undertaker on the rest of the National Hockey League with coming out of the coffin along with his teammates and trying to get this team to the playoffs. But uh, as far as the games go tonight, again, it's Pittsburgh at the Leafs and the Vegas Golden Knights, who again gave up six unanswered goals on Friday to the Arizona Coyotes. I still cannot believe that. Uh, they are plus 106, and the Vancouver Canucks are minus 124. Uh, the big game tonight, certainly down here south of the border, is the uh, March Madness finale. The Purdue Boilermakers, led by Canadian Zach Eady, six and a half point underdogs to the favored Connecticut Huskies. Connecticut minus 6.5. Uh, and we do have some baseball as well. Jays getting the uh, Seattle Mariners uh, tonight. Jays minus 115 favorites, Seattle plus 102. And, uh, you know, while we're at it and we have a second, the Masters is up. Odds have sort of changed a little bit after the weekend, but we mentioned Scotty Scheffler was minus was plus 475, shortest favorite we've seen since Tiger Woods in his prime. Plus 450 now for Scotty. He is the clear cut favorite. Uh, then there's Rory McIlroy looking for his first green jacket, 11 to 1. John Rahm coming off a team win for Legion 13 at Live Miami on the weekend. Rahm is at 12 to 1. Xander Shoffley, who was 20 to 1 last week, he's now at 16 to 1. Brooks Kepka, 20 to 1. Hideki Matsuyama's had a great year. He was 33 to 1 last week. He's now 22 to 1. Jordan Spieth, 25. Ludwig Oberg, the uh, young prodigy stud, he's 28 to 1, along with Liv star Joachim Neiman. And uh, 33s on the board for Patrick Cantley, Wyndham Clark, Victor Hovland. That's actually come from 25 last week to 33, as well as Will Zalatoris. And uh, Matt Fitzpatrick looked good on the weekend. He's at 40 to 1, along with Bryson DeChambeau, Dustin Johnson, Cam Smith. And Justin Thomas. If you have not played at CoolBet before, use the promo code WST when you make your first deposit. Hook you up with a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks. Uh, and you can, of course, use that in the sports book. You can also use that on the poker side of things. And keep in mind, we are having a Winnipeg Sports Talk, Edmonton Sports Talk, Lock Shop Poker Tourney. We will have details as soon as the playoffs are finalized with when that event is going to be and would love for some of you to jump in with us on what should be a real fun online tourney where there will be bounties on the head of myself, Nielsen, Remus, and maybe one of the other EST guys. So uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, well, I can tell you it's a little bit lighter when I look outside right now, Reem, but we didn't really get much of the eclipse here because there's just there was just too much... Uh, there was too much cloud, which um, was a bit of a bummer, I guess, for a lot of people here. But different spots that what you showed over from Indianapolis looked uh, looked pretty wild. Yeah, I pulled up. I had to do it. Everyone was talking about it in chat. It was like 203. And everyone's like, oh, is it happening right now? And I just pulled up the NASA uh, feed on YouTube. They got 320,000 in their stream right now, a bit more uh, than we have than we have here. But um Watching the eclipse, so a lot of interest. Everyone's talking about it. I kept looking out my window. It looked bright. It looked the same as it normally does, but uh, it was kind of cool there. And what is it? Once every 20, ne next one's in 20 years. So Yeah, I next get... one's 20 years for North America, or at least the United States. I'm not sure if there's maybe a spot. I was just watching one of the weather reports here before we came on. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, see, we'll, see what that, we'll see when that happens. If we missed it, you missed it here today. Uh, people in Nashville, they didn't get much of it because of the cloud cover. Uh, but apparently it was a 95% here. Um, there were, I, I, I knew a few uh, people reading that actually drove down to different parts of the United States to get, uh, to get a look of the, uh, of the full, uh, the full eclipse. I did see some videos of some online, uh, online of some meteorologists who are overly excited both the eclipse, like you know how like we're so excited about WrestleMania yesterday and like the Undertaker sh showing up, and we're there's people who get that you know that psyched up for uh, the eclipse. So I don't know. I'm not. It didn't really move 
the needle. I think it's good for online jokes about like looking right at it. I see Gritty online is, you know, already Gritty's making good. jokes. I did get um letters from, you know, my kids' daycares that they weren't going to take the kids outside during the eclipse, which is something that I had never considered like eclipse safety. So it is a real thing. It's important. It, it did happen. It is certainly. And I, weren't there memes of like uh, Donald Trump like years ago looking right at it without the glasses? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Like, I remember yes, there's there a lot was. of comedy coming out of the eclipse. I think I care more about the conversation surrounding it than actually, uh, what is it, the moon going in front of the sun during the day? That's what it is? That's the, the actual thing that's going on? Yes, that is, yeah. A full eclipse is when it, you know, based on, you know, where it is, it blocks the sun out, it gets dark, mm -hmm. um, but whatever. It can be dangerous, and, you know, you got those. I remember we had one when I was a kid in elementary school, and they gave us the glasses, which looked like those 3D paper glasses, which you had to wear. Kids wouldn't inevitably take that off. And I see, like, do those do anything? Like, I see people, like, handing them out. I'm like, what What are those? Yes, they're they're apparently to prevent uh, people from getting dinged up by the uh, UV rays and have eye damage. Anyways, if you, you can let us know. Hit us up on, on X uh, at Sports Talk WPG if you've got any pictures, information on all of that. Uh, less <laughs> Eclipse talk tomorrow, more Jets Preds talk. Uh, Max Hers going to jump on the program. Ken will join me live as well. We'll do that from Bridgestone Arena tomorrow. And Feinberg with his thoughts on the Masters before he and Pat are actually doing shows from the Circus Swim this weekend for the Masters. Very jealous of that. But in the meantime, great to a uh, great show today, Remo. We made it happen tomorrow from the rink. Looking forward to that. Um, thanks to Bob Herrig who joined us. Thanks to Connor Rabchak who jumped on. Uh, Jeff Hamilton and Remo figuring it all out and getting us uh, available and sounding good on the program today. Um, that was a fun one. Tomorrow, the party continues. Not Morgan Wallen style. We'll keep it together, uh, but we'll be ready to go for Jets Preds tomorrow. Join me live at 1 p.m. on YouTube from Bridgestone Arena. Jets and Preds pregame with Max Hers from the Preds side of things. Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press. Thanks to all the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Have a phenomenal afternoon and evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow from Music City as the Jets continue their road trip and get ready for the Stanley Cup playoffs. Oh, my God! Oh! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com. 